I'm uh, John Alvin Wilkins. Um, I'm a longtime Drupal com contributor. I've uh, been doing uh, web development since 1993, so over 20 years, and Drupal development for almost 11. Um, been around a bit. <laughs> um, I uh, am a senior front-end developer for Previous Next. Um, they, they're pretty awesome. They, they, I live in Taiwan, but they flew me out here just for this conference, so um, thank you for, for that. Um, and uh, I've got a lot of free gifts, <laughs> um, open source software that I work on. Um, ZenGrids is a, um, it's a SaaS Encompass library that allows you to easily create layouts, um, normalized ICSS for SAS Encompass, um, KSS node, I'll be talking a lot more about this one later in the presentation that does automated style guides. Um, Get SVN, migrate, which if you have any subversion repositories lining around, this can automate the process of getting rid of all of them. Um, and then of course the, the Zen theme for Drupal. Um, and today I wanted to talk about you know, where are we headed in front end development. Um, a, 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 I like to start with actually a, a quote here from Nicholas Gallagher. Ooh. Yeah, it just, just doesn't sit up there very well. Is there a way to angle it so it doesn't, my laptop isn't, it's, I don't have an, it's got that nice Mac bevel on the bottom that just goes whoosh. I think this is gonna make it worse, it's on the wrong end. It, oh, you mean from, oh, that's tricky. Angle it more, even make it, or yeah, gaffer tape. Just to, sure. Okay. Yeah, cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> excitement. Uh, I'd like to start with a quote from Nicholas Gallagher. Um, he said, you know, are you new to front end development? Um, here's a secret no one really knows what they're doing either. Um, this, is, this is completely understandable because we have. You know, tons of tons of front-end blog posts that are talking about all these different things. You know, Vagrant, web components, Twig handlers, Jenkins, CSS, JS hunting, and we're sort of expected to to know about all of these different things. Um, and it's it's really really overwhelming. Um, and uh, you can't really make any sense of it all. Um, Frank uh, Chimero said, uh, "Everyone is describing the one little piece they've created." but they don't explain or even reference the larger concepts of how all of these elements link together, right? Um, and this is sort of understandable. I mean, we're at a tech conference right now. People like to focus on the technology and you know, when they're, you know, we're all mostly geeks here. And so yeah, we, we tend to focus really intensely on that technology. And it's sort of like getting up really, really close to a painting and sticking your eyeball and seeing all these you know, wonderful brush strokes and, um, you know, you can see the, 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 the paint palettes that they're using, and, and it's, it's great, but you can't, tell, you can't tell what painting this is. You can't tell the bigger picture until you start looking at, you know, the process, right? And then all of those, all of those you know, the technology details make much more sense in context of what's actually going on. So when we, we step back and try to figure out what's going on, in the front end, you're trying to make sense of the front end technology. Basically, I can describe any project, any front end project on GitHub, I can describe with one of these three things or a combination. Front end performance, components, or continuous integration. Um, front end performance, I'm sure everybody's heard of that. You know, you're trying to make things faster. The components, continuous integration, these are get, getting a bit jargony. Um, so to simplify that, I just want to say that it's, it's Making shit faster, making shit modular, and then automating the shit. Okay, that's it. Those three things, that's the entire spectrum of all front end technology. Okay? Um, so, I've given this talk a few times, um, keep sort of improving upon it, um, and uh, I gave a talk very similar to this um, 
at the last Drupal South in Wellington. Um, but one of the things that happened, like, right after that was that previous Next actually sent me to um, a Scrum tech, Scrum training, and I learned about Agile development. Um, and I want to talk about, that was a really profound experience for me. And I want to talk about the problems that we're having doing CSS is directly related to some of the ways that we're doing projects. Okay. Um, here's, you know, a traditional waterfall project. You have planning, designing, and developing and theming. It's usually, it works in this direction. Maybe there's some overlap between development and theming. But you have all of your designs done ahead of time, right? And then you do the theming bit. Um, and the problem is that is that if this starts to slip and take longer, then like you get to this spot and you realize I don't have enough time to finish all the theming, and then you have to like negotiate with the client, you know, um, oh we're not going to do that bit of the design or that bit of the design, and effectively what you end up with is half of the stuff is done. And that means you've wasted this time, and this time, and this time, and you basically could have completed the entire project in half the time if you'd known that you were gonna miss the date. <laughs> That's not so good. So, you know, people, they start to get better at it. Maybe they'll, they'll reevaluate things here at the end of the design, they're like, oh, we're not gonna hit the deadline, we can already tell. And then they're like, okay, we're gonna, and a designer sort of over-designed it because we can't implement all these designs and we'll take off those bits. And they give them a style guide and then bend the project, they're reviewing it like, well, what of this is missing? Oh, remember we talked about that. It's not going in, like, oh yeah. But there's, there's a lot of conflicts then between clients um, and uh, you know, the team that is actually developing it. Um, and, and agile development really tries to solve these problems. Um, and the, the sort of core concept in any agile development is reducing your, redis your, reducing your risk by controlling and minimizing your risk. So here's what an agile project would look like. You have the same start and end deadline, but instead of just you know, starting and doing all of your steps until you get to the deadline, you divide that time into a series of sprints. Um, typically they're two or three or four week sprints they have a very defined um, start and end time. And then you uh, work with your client and you come up with a feature backlog, which basically is a list of all the features that they want to have on their, in their project, on their website, um, and you prioritize it. You say these are the most high priority features that the, the client wants, I should say, not when I say you prioritize it, the client should be prioritizing, the, the owner of this project should be prioritizing these things. And then you start with the first sprint and basically you're gonna say, we're gonna work on these first couple of things and we're gonna complete them inside this sprint and then show the client what we've finished so far and then you go on to the next sprint and you pull in some more features like that. Um, and, and at the end of each sprint, you're, you're reprioritizing what's going on, what's left on the list, right? So the client's always aware of what's the most high priority stuff, and you really do need to reprioritize at the end of each sprint because their understanding of the project will change as the project continues. You always have these problems where you're like, oh, we asked for this. Well, actually, no, you asked for this other thing. You didn't explain yourself well. This can get rid of those problems because the worst case scenario is at the beginning of the sprint, they tell you something bad. At the end of the sprint, you discover there was miscommunication, right? And that just means that in the next sprint, you iterate over that, that feature and get it right the next time. Right? And then it really reduces the risk because they're not gonna wait till the very end to discover that the client didn't, or you didn't communicate with the client very well. So uh, yeah, each two-week sprint, prioritizes project goals, completes a set of features, and then creates sort of a minimally releasable product, right? Um, I won't get into the like, the you know, a lot of these Agile specifics, but I just want to talk about how, what does it mean for Agile and the web to work together, right? Um, when I got hired by Previous Next, uh, my boss, Kim Pepper, was like, okay, I know you've been doing a lot of stuff with CSS, um, trying to make that very modular. Um, how do we get 
designers into this Agile process. And, and I hadn't yet been trained on Agile. Um, and I said, no, I have no idea. Um, we'll figure that together. Um, and then once I did the training, it became really, really obvious. It became simple. Um, and basically, Agile to the web plus the web means uh, style guide driven development. Um, and the only two requirements of style guide driven development are component based design and automated style guides. Now, if you remember from the earlier slide, uh, components, that means modular. Um, automated style guides, that's the automation part, right? So um, we're talking about making our designs modular and then automatically documenting those designs inside a style guide. That's the core of what style guide driven development is. And uh, I want to talk super briefly about what we're doing wrong with our CSS currently um, to help you understand why making component-based design is so compelling. Um, I used to have four or five slides here that talked about you know, specifics of how you're doing stuff wrong, um, but I want to make this fast, um, and maybe we can spend some more time at the end uh, discussing things and uh, going over some demos. Um, so let's do a, a, a quick survey instead to talk about what we're doing. Um, Drupal 7 CSS. Um, how many people here really like Drupal 7's core CSS? Yes, nobody has raised their hand. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I was heavily involved in the Drupal 7 development. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> I, <laughs> when you work with it day in and day out, you, you, you start to see some of the issues that you have. You have, you know, super high specificity on some of the CSS selectors. Um, overly generic class names like title and content. Um, just, just bad CSS class names in general, node. Uh, it's not particularly good CSS. Um, and uh, design components are uh, basically a way to, to give us a framework for writing better CSS. Okay. Um, and when I say design components, the front end development community is starting to, to get together and consolidate and, and understand this concept, but for some reason we can't decide on what to call it. Uh, so component is the same thing as object in OO CSS, which is object oriented CSS, module in uh, uh, SMAX, which is scalable and modular architecture for CSS, and it's the block in BEMS block element modifier, and, and also sometimes called a UI pattern. Right, a, a pattern library is full of components, basically. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to like, it's a component, it's a design thing. But anyway, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about all these things, they're all the same thing. So CSS design component um, is basically, it, it, uh, it's applied to a loose collection of HTML. I'm not trying to enforce any particular DOM structure um, in the HTML, it's repeatable which means that you can apply that design uh, multiple times on a page, uh, even if it's never repeated. So like your header can, should be a component. You should write it in a component way so that it's modular, compact. It applies exactly that header design. And theoretically, you could apply it multiple times. But if you just write everything as a component, it's going to make your life easier. Um, and it's also specific. Like I said, it's, it applies that design um, specifically to the, the, um, the elements that you apply that class to. And self-contained. Um, the style shouldn't bleed off into other things. Um, and, and finally, nestable. Um, so you can have uh, nest, uh, sorry, you can have a, um, a component inside like the HTML DOM of another component. That's perfectly fine. And let me show you um, an example. This is a PRI website, which I, I helped to do the CSS for this. It's one of the first sites that I tried out these ideas of, of component design. And uh, you can see here there's this little, it's hard to see on the screen, but there's a little circle there with a number in there, which is like the, the share count or something. I can't remember exactly what it does. Um, but that. That is a repeated design element 
Um, actually, I'll show you the bottom here. Um, you can see that it's also, that share count is also over here. So I made that a very simple, it's basically, there's, I think there's a, a span or a div or something wrapped around that number that says that it is the share count design component, right? And um, then we also have um, here at the top with this, the main picture, the main title and the teaser text here, this is the feature component. It's so like showing off the, the featured story on this page and it includes different pieces. Um, we have the sort of taxonomy, po politics and society, um, the feature image, the feature title, uh, feature dates, you know, feature text. Those are different parts of a more complex design component. It has multiple HTML elements, um, it's going to have a couple different classes on there, um, and, uh, and and you can see there that the that other share count co component is nested inside it, um, and basically went through the entire site and tried to find these repeatable patterns and made those into components. So, yeah, um, and uh, how many people have? I've heard about Smacks. Fair for you. How many people have, have actually like read the you know either the the free book or the uh, the paid book? A few of you. So uh, Jonathan Snook um, tries to categorize different CSS um, using Smacks: um, base, layout, module, state, and theme. It's it's like he looked at Drupal and said, "How can I troll them as much as possible?" Um, <laughs> So <laughs> when, when we, when we uh, in the Drupal community started looking at this, we were like, oh, this is awesome, but we kind of need to use different terminology or we're going to get really confused. So we usually use uh, base, layout, component, state, and skin, but they're the same categorizing um, ideas. Um, and so when I started working on, on PRA and other websites, I, I thought this was pretty good, but I was having a little bit of a hard time actually implementing it on my CSS. Um, and I realized that it was, that really state and skin are describing, they're, they're describing components themselves. They're not really, they're not equal to components, they're parts of components. So that was why I was having a little bit of trouble understanding SMACs. Um, and there was also some missing bits here, um, which BEM helped out understanding as well. So we have like the component wrapper, um, elements, modifiers, states and skin. And um, so let me go over all of these different pieces here. Um, base. So in Smacks, base is basically it's a, um, at all of your rules that are using HTML elements as the selector, that's your base styles. Okay. You're describing what the default look and feel of an HTML element is on your website. Um, I use the, the base styling as, uh, I try to target that styling to be the styling that you would see uh, in the main part of your site, in the main content area of your site. So like WYSIWYG editors are famous for having, making it difficult to get the right HTML that you really want. So um, I usually let the WYSIWYG editors do whatever they want for HTML and that base styling then is trying to apply the design that I want to those elements in the main part of the content page. And then everything else is overriding that, those base element stylings. Um, and, and I should say that as I've started thinking about this more and more, um, base and layouts, they're not separate from components. They, they actually are components too. They're just a specialized kind of component. Um, so layout components, are uh, basically they the only thing that they do they're specialized in that um, instead of applying like you know colors and uh, you know background colors and, and all that stuff all they do is move large sections of your page around that's all they're concerned with they want to put the left sidebar over there on the left right? they want to put the footer down at the bottom below the other stuff that's what they're concerned about and that's the only thing they do um, you know whether you consider padding part of the layout or not, it doesn't really matter to me. I usually put padding inside my layouts because my content goes inside the layouts and therefore I need you know, gutters between my content. 
Um, and that's the only thing they do. They shouldn't add any other kind of styling. Um, and then next, um, these are the different sections, different parts of a component. Components, element modifier, state, and skin. I'm going to go through several different slides here that really help you to visualize what these different parts here. Um, I used to like ramble on and like point at the slide and like, if this is an element, and it was, um, I decided to go with a visual metaphor. So uh, I got this idea from, from this quote. This is, uh, I'm trying to describe, explain radio uh, to people who have never heard radio. This is back, you know, in the early 1930s, 1920s. I said, you see, radio is a kind of very, very long cat. Uh, you, you pull its tail in Los Angeles and it's meowing in New York. Uh, the only difference between radio uh, and this is that there, there is no cat. <laughs> um, that's Albert Einstein. <laughs> Brilliant quote. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to describe these things using the flower component. Okay. So the component itself uh, oftentimes has some sort of wrapper elements. Uh, the class that you would apply to that is just, you know, flower, dot flower. That's our selector, right? Um, and then if we start breaking these down into elements or different parts, um, we can, we'll have like the flower petals. Um, this double underscore thing here is uh, a BEM um, methodology of, of separating these different um, concepts of, you know, our component is the first part of it and the element is the second part and we need some sort of thing to go in between them so you can easily tell which, which is which. You can use other things if you don't like double underscores. Uh, the double underscores and the double dashes that I'm gonna show you in a second here are, are the, the Drupal 8 uh, standards that we decided to adopt. Um, so these are petals. Um, we also have uh, flower underscore underscore face, uh, flower stem, flower leaves. These are all different pieces that require specific styling within you know, the component. Um, but I, I want to point out that we are not talking about a DOM structure when we're defining this name. This does not mean that leaves has to be a child element of the flower parent element. Um, this is a loose collection of HTML elements, as I was saying before, because you can also have flower bed. And obviously, you know, a flower bed is surrounding the flower, right? It's not you know, inside the flower, and yet it's completely related to the flower. You're not gonna have this flower bed styling anywhere else except with the flower, okay? Um, next, we're gonna go on to modifier here. Um, this is a, a variant of our component, our flower component. Uh, it now looks like a tulip um, because we're applying this flower dash dash tulip class to the element, and so you can see that we've changed the way that the petals look, but everything else is the same, the face, the leaves, the stem, everything else the same. Now, a lot of times when people see this uh, double underscore and double dash and they, they, they start writing their own components for the first time, they get a little bit crazy. Um, don't make it complicated. It should be very, very simple. Um, I, I pulled this next selector uh, from an actual website. I'm not gonna tell you which website. <laughs> um, but you can see here, they went crazy with their, their double underscores. Channel dash tab underscore underscore guide underscore underscore upcoming dash video underscore underscore info underscore underscore time. Was, I was really happy to learn yesterday that we were going to display our slides in widescreen format because this is the first time I've been able to show the entire class on screen. Uh, to make them simple, <laughs> please. Um, I'm going to go a little derail here off a second for two. Um, on the meaning of semantics, right? Um, content semantics, like what your actual content is, like articles, uh, blog posts, you know, news, events, that sort of stuff, that's handled by HTML5 semantics, really. Um, so let's make our cl class names um, be design semantics, right? You're trying to describe the design that you're applying, right? 
I mean, this makes sense. You're adding styling with these CSS rule sets. The name of the selector should also be the name of the design, right? So those class names should be meaningful to developers and designers. And they don't need to be meaningful for anybody else. Um, and also don't, don't stress out. I mean, I know that naming things is really hard in uh, CS, uh, in computer science. Um, don't stress out about too much. Um, you can name it whatever as long as you convey some meaning to the group of people that you're working with. And you can always rename it, rename it later. That's easy. Uh, so let's, let's jump back over to uh, our component again. So here's a state. Um, this is what happens when you hover over the flower component. I have a nice little B styling on there. Uh, colon hover. Um, in, in addition to these, these uh, pseudo classes uh, state, you can also have like a JavaScript state. So you had some sort of um, some some sort of form or something that you, you filled out, and then suddenly it's you're adding a new class with JavaScript. So now it's is pollinating, right? Um, that's another kind of state. Uh, there is also uh, media queries, right? Uh, a media query is a state of this component. For example, uh, this is the desktop version of our Flower component, right? So at media min width of 48 ms. That's that's what it looks like. Um, and of course, you know, print styles, those are also you know, media types. Um, that's another kind of state. So here's our print styling. Um, and then lastly, uh, skin. Um, I didn't used to have a slide for this, um, but then I gave this, uh, these slides, I presented them uh, the last time I was in Australia at a, at a meetup, and somebody says, do an is night uh, skin, right? So, uh, new slide. Um, a skin is basically, a, let's see here, here we go. It's a global modifier. Um, so it, it creates a new variation of how this looks, but it, it's applied to every component on your site, right? So the, the actual CSS rules for this will be next to all the other CSS rules for this component. But the selector itself, the is night, you know, and that class name is going to be on like the body tag or, or something, or some sort of div that's apparent of a lot of different components. So this skin is basically just a global modifier. Um, if you want to take a look at these, um, there's actually a copy of all of these in, in CSS form. An um, automated style guide of this uh, is available here johnalbum.github.io slash flower dash power. Um, and here's an overview of all the selectors in one, one go here. So we have the component. Um, sometimes you can't name a component except with two words, just can't figure it out. Um, you could either use camel case, and people in Drupal were like, oh, we don't want to use camel case, so we ended up with this dash in between each of the words. Uh, this is why, of course, in the modifier, it's doing double dash, right? Um, so then our modifier is mod creating a variant of the component. Um, our component has lots of uh, pieces, so we have multiple elements, and again, an element might require two words to describe them. Um, sometimes that element will have a variant styling um, depending on the, you know, the global modifier. Uh, so there are two ways you can do that. You can either uh, write this more complex CSS class name with the uh, modifier here, um, or you could actually create a selector that used that first one there and then this third one, right, as your selector. That would be fine too, the same selector. Um, but, but my point is that this is the most complex select, uh, class name you should ever write. There shouldn't be anything more complex than that. Um, JavaScript state, pseudo class states, media query states, and then our global modifiers skins. So that's it. It's not really that complicated. If you write all of your CSS using these as, these as the selectors of your rule sets, you're going to end up with, with much better CSS. Um, here, here it is again. Sign components, it's, they're applying to a loose collection of HTML. Um, you should be able to apply um, these, that same design to a different kind of HTML. Right. There's no reason why you couldn't apply that, that share count um, to a different you know, HTML element. Um, 
repeatable, specific, self-contained, nestable. Uh, one last time here. Base components, layout components. Again, those are just specialized kinds of components. And then components are these different things. Elements, modifiers, states, and skin. Um, I have a, there we go. What I just described is basically uh, the Drupal 8 coding standards. Um, we have, uh, th these are completely new. Um, we had like draft uh, CSS standards for like three years. <laughs> and then finally I was like, this is enough, enough. Oh, let's, let's actually decide on something. So last year we finally have official CSS coding standards and they are there. Um, and they will also describe um, a really great uh, documentation about all of this these classes and modifiers and stuff are all up there too. And, and also the pitfalls, they go into detail about, about what we're doing wrong so that you know, as you're writing CSS, you can go back and like, oops, I shouldn't be doing that because this is why it's a pitfall. Really great documentation. Um, so when I'm writing CSS, you know, where do I put it? I'm using SAS. I hope that most of you are. Um, this is my, my organization, it's very simple. Uh, I have an init partial that has, defines, uh, or sorry, it, it actually it loads the variables at the top. Uh, then it loads um, all of the you know, third party libraries that I use, uh, like uh, the breakpoint module, which is awesome for controlling media queries, um, and then some sort of layout module, singularity or, or Zen grids or whatever you want, or SUSE, um, those are all good ones. Uh, then inside the base folder I'll have uh, all of my, my base components, the, uh, the styles that are, designing a, des, that are designing the HTML elements themselves go in there. Um, and then I'll have layout um, with all of my individual layouts that are completely repeatable. Um, they go in, in there. And then everything else is inside components. And I mean everything. Each component, oh yeah. Each component goes into a separate file. I'll open up that in a second. Um, sometimes I have custom mixins or custom functions. Um, I'll put this into the library folder. But that's, that's the entire structure. Um, styles.scss, that's the actual uh, main style sheet that gets generated into styles.css. That's the only bit that goes inside my .info file of my theme. And then everything else gets loaded. Um, by styles. Um, yeah, Let's see, imports the init, imports the base, imports layouts, uh, components. Um, how many people here use um, Magda? What's the name of the? Oh, globbing, SAS globbing. That was called, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and use that. It's fine. You don't have to do spell it out like this. We use SAS globbing as well, but. If you don't use SAS globbing, um, that can that syntax can be confusing. This is this is how you would load it. Um, yeah. So here I've opened up the components folder, and you can see that every single component is a separate file. When I tried this out the first time, um, I, I had been working on a project. And, and then it was like, it was crunch time because we weren't yet doing Agile. Um, and so they brought in another front-end developer to help me finish. And um, he took a look at this folder structure and he was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was freaked out for a good five minutes. I, I wasn't next to him, so uh, like, I didn't know about this until later. Um, but he's like, okay, breathe. <laughs> um, and he had this ticket, he's like, okay, I need to, uh, there's a bug in this one, styling. Uh, so he. He did this, he inspected the DOM, um, he saw that there was this class uh, name on that thing, and then he went and looked on the components folder, and lo and behold, there was a file name that had that exact same class name. He's like, open it up, and there it was. It's ridiculously easy to find your components when you're doing development, if you use this, it, it, it looks crazy, because I only got to down to the Ds on this list, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, but it's it's incredibly simple organization. Some people like to have subfolders. The subfolders confuse me. I can't figure out where anything is. I have to look in all the different subfolders then. 
Um, Anyway, but this, this is less of an issue now that we have um, source maps where it can like show, in the inspector can show you exactly the file name of the SAS part, well, that's pretty awesome. So then you can do, you can do subfolders if you use uh, source maps. Um, so now, I know that some of you are, are thinking, this sounds great, this is awesome, but I'm a Drupal developer. <laughs> right? It, and there's no way in hell I can insert that exact class name into my markup because I have no freaking clue which render API slash theme function slash template file, this piece of slash content slash database, where this piece of HTML is coming from. But there's good news. Um, there's the fugly selector hack. Um, what I do, I, this requires SAS. You can't do this with CSS. Well, I mean, you can, but it, You'll get messed up. Um, basically, I, I write the selector in the DOM that I couldn't change because I could not figure out how to like insert the class I wanted into that link inside this piece of content, right? Um, and then I write the class name I wish I could use in the DOM as the thing that I'm extending, right? So this goes at the bottom of each of my component files. So I've, I've written the design at the top using these amazing, wonderful class names that I can't actually get into the source. Uh, and they have uh, this percent sign at the beginning, which means it's a silent selector inside the selector. So like I'll have, at the top of this file, I'll actually have dot feature underscore title dash link under the assumption that I could eventually get into the DOM, and then comma, and then percent sign feature underscore title dash link. Um, and then I'll write this at the bottom, which is the, the ugly Drupal selector that I am forced to use. And then I just extend into the actual thing. Um, and I, I wasn't sure this would work, and it works great. It's amazing. You, you, you don't end up with bleeding. As long as you use the right specific uh, you know, Drupal class there, it's not going to bleed. Do you have a question? Oh, five minutes. Five minutes, OK. Thank goodness I am on slide 52 of 55. <laughs> um, so automated style guides. This is the thing that pulls it all together, okay? Um, because um, understanding the concepts of the, the CSS component design is great, but it's still, it's hard, to, hard to do when you have Drupal as the thing that you're trying to compare it against. Um, and I found that by automatically generating a style guide from the SAS files that I'm working on, it made it much easier to visualize. Um, what do I mean by automating, automating the style guide? So basically, um, I've got a component library here, which means like I've, I have a Drupal theme, and inside the Drupal theme, I wrote all these different design components, right? Individual design components, um, and you know CSS source. It goes through the preprocessor, or it's SAS source actually. And, you know, it goes through the preprocessor, it becomes CSS files. Um, sometimes you can also have HTML stuff if you're using what's the JavaScript preprocessor. Um, Sorry? CoffeeScript, yes. I don't use it, but yeah, CoffeeScript. Um, KSS style, stands for Nile Style Sheets. Uh, some guy named K-N-Y-L-E, Nile. Um, and he wrote this spec that uh, describes um, automated, uh, describes a comment syntax. Um, basically, you write a comment in a very specific way, and the, this uh, script then can go through and read and parse all of your SAS files and then generate a set of HTML static files that are become your style guide. And now we're going to jump over to the demo part of the, the presentation. Let me pull up. So this is a, whoops, I think I can fix this real fast. turned off. 
off the wife because I thought I didn't need it because this is local to my own machine. Mm -hmm. yeah, I had it working the other day, but um, anyway. If I reload now. Okay, cool. Okay, so this is a style guide that is uh, automatically generated from the from the source, and let me show you here. This is the um, the the spec that describes um, how you write these these comments and. This one's better. So this is, let me get that bigger. This is a comment that you can put inside your, your SAS, and, and it'll work with CSS as well. You can use the standard CSS comments, one at the top, one at the very bottom, and none of the inners, you know, the slash slash stuff if you're using raw CSS. Um, but the only thing that's required here inside this documentation for your component is the name of the component and then where in the style guide you want it to be. Um, KSS requires you to define sort of the, the hierarchy of what you wanted to have for your uh, style guide. Um, and then you, you decide your own hierarchy and then you just have to tell KSS where each of your components in the hierarchy goes. So that and this are the only bits that are required. The second part there is a description about it. Um, if you've got modifiers, um, you put them here. Um, so we have an or states. So this is a hover state, disable state. This is a primary and smaller um, modifier for it. Um, and this doesn't use the Drupal 8 standards, this documentation here, because uh, it's not a Drupal thing. This is just a KSS thing. And if you run KSS node, it will go and generate a style guide uh, from these documentation, and you'll end up with something that looks like this. Um, so here we have like all of our colors documented. And oops, where'd my mouse go? Okay. Base styling here, um, heading levels. Um, we'll jump over the components here, and you can see this is the this is the style guide that I'm right now adding to Zen 7.x 6.x. Uh, so out of the box here, as soon as I tag and release here, it will have all of its CSS documented with KSS comments, so that you get a style guide for everything. Um, you know, autocomplete styling, um, the highlight mark like new and updated comments, message styling, um, breadcrumb navigation, tabs, it's all gonna be in here. Uh, responsive video, if we should resize this, you can see it's shrinking and getting bigger. Um, this is amazing when you're developing. You write something, um, you have like a gulp or a grunt task that's automatically watching all of your code, it generates the CSS, it generates a style guide, you go and look at it, it's wonderful. Um, I set up a boff for the, the last slot of the day where we can actually go over and I can show you like how to get KSS node running and stuff. Um, but this really, really ties everything together um, and makes writing your components much easier because you can actually see it as you develop it. Um, and it also helps tremendously with the Agile process because you don't want to do all the designs ahead of time. For every feature that you start at the beginning of a sprint, you have your designer and front-end developer work together to create a design, and as you write it, it goes in the style guide. The next feature that comes, you look at your style guide and go, hmm, is there an existing design I can reuse? And if not, then you create a new one. If you see one that's designed that's almost right, you can make a variation, a modifier of that. Right? That's your process then. Each new feature, look at the style guide. Yes, no, something new. Right? Those are your designs. It becomes really easy. I love this process. I know that everybody is going to be doing agile development in 10 years, but we're just not there yet. This is going to be the road ahead. I promise you. Thank you.